Right now, they will tackle tough times in California. The economic troubles facing San Diego will be the focus of Mayor Jerry Sanders' annual State of the City. The reports a 60% hike in rapes where either one or both people... ...will track the progress of 50 sarcoma patients using a From the KPBS studios, this is San Diego Week. Good evening, I'm Amitha Sharma. Thanks for joining us. Tonight, we'll discuss whether government regulations are stunting the local biotech industry and which San Diego high school is wooing the president to speak at graduation. And why are so few students from Lincoln High School, one of the most expensive campuses in the district, headed for college? Greg Mortensen's acclaimed book, Three Cups of Tea, may be only partially full. We'll find out why. Plus, a preview of the Culture Shock Center's breakdance performance this weekend at the Garfield Theater in La Jolla. That's coming up on San Diego Week, but first, the headlines. Peggy Pico joins me from the KPBS News Center with more on the arrest in the 163 freeway shooting. Peggy? Amitha, 58-year-old Stephen Dragasitz was arrested Wednesday night at a shopping center in Claremont Mesa. Police say Dragasitz fired about a dozen shots along 163 during morning rush hour on April 5th. Investigators say DNA evidence helped break the case. It is a unique profile, so unless Mr. Dragasitz has an identical twin, uh, the DNA uh, is his. The shootings left one college student wounded. Councilman Carl DeMaio wants to know why San Diego firefighters are paid a lot more than paramedics and EMTs who work for private ambulance companies. But the president of the San Diego Firefighters Union says there's a good reason for the pay discrepancy. At a minimum, they should know there is huge difference between the limited abilities of a private sector EMT and all risk response capability of a San Diego Fire Rescue Firefighter EMT. And our wet winter has created an abundant water supply in California reservoirs. Governor Jerry Brown declared the drought is over. And the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California recently announced that it will end water supply restrictions implemented in 2009. The County Water Authority has not said, though, if they will also lift water restrictions in San Diego. You can see all of the week's top stories on our website at kpbs.org. San Diego's congressional representatives got an earful from leaders in the biotech and pharmaceutical industries during a hearing in La Jolla this week. KPBS business reporter Eric Anderson covered the story. Eric, what did the pharmaceutical industry reps say was the biggest problem facing them? Well, I think what they were focusing on was some of the regulations that they have to deal with in the drug approval and in the device approval process. This was the latest in a string of hearings that Daryl Issa has had around the country. And what he's trying to identify are regulatory roadblocks to creating jobs in the United States. And that's what he wanted to hear from the biotech people. They thought, uh, you know, saw a couple of concerns that they had brought up before that are well known in the industry that perhaps uh, NIH funding, stability in the NIH funding uh, uh, process, and also some sort of a reform in the Food and Drug Administration to get more drugs to market fast. They're concerned because last year, only 21 drugs approved by the FDA, the year before, only 36. And of course, that's their financial lifeblood. So what are these same pharmaceutical reps proposing as a possible solution? Well, there are a couple of things uh, in the reform of the FDA. The FDA was kind of singled out a little bit during this congressional information gathering hearing. And what they suggested was finding some way to not only reform the process so that the drug approval process moves along better, but also to at times include um, the representatives of the people who are, are getting the treatments from those drugs to kind of get their voice in it as well. And, you know, the reforms that they talked about uh, kind of ran the gamut. Here, uh, Daryl Issa, who I spoke to after the meeting, uh, explains that it, it could be a, a pretty big overhaul. Part of FDA's problem is the mixed message between food and drugs, and that it may be time to have food go all the way over to the Department of Agriculture so that the Drug Administration would focus on that and be held more accountable. And, of course, that's a pretty major overhaul, overhauling the Food and Drug Administration. He said some of the fixes may be easy. Maybe it's just putting a new rule into place or taking a rule that's holding up uh, the process out of you know, the mix so that the process will get easier. 
So you also mentioned speed, that that is some of the frustration that these pharmaceutical reps have with the current process. But there has, the FDA has received some criticism in the past for rushing these drugs to market without uh, proper diligence. And the painkiller Vioxx comes to mind. Did anybody, in particular congressional representatives, express any concern about that? Well, the congressmen were there mainly to hear the concerns from the industry. I thought it was interesting that the head of UCSD Connect, which is kind of this incubation group at UCSD that helps startups and helps develop uh, uh, research into products. They suggested perhaps allowing the patients who are going to be taking the risk to have more of a role in the hearing process. Right now it's the FDA and the people who want the drug approved who are working together to get drugs to market. And, and the patient's voice sometimes is held on the outside and they suggest that maybe people who are willing to take the risk with a new drug uh, should have more of a voice in the process and help determine whether or not that drug gets used. Switching gears slightly, uh, Congressman Issa has come under a lot of criticism recently for lobbying for an earmark to improve a highway which was next to a medical property that he planned to purchase in Vista. You talked to him about that. What did he say? Well, let's understand what earmarks are, first of all. It's a way for a congressman to set aside a part of an approved budget package, like say the Defense Department, for a specific project. Uh, there are quite often um, projects that have some kind of uh, uh, worth in the local community, uh, and, and it's a way for a congressman to put funds into those projects. And what Daryl Issa uh, reportedly did was um, a, a progressive, uh, think progressive uh, website said that what Daryl Issa did was lobby for earmarks to widen a highway and then later brought a property that was on that highway that would have benefited from it. And uh, I asked the congressman about that and this is what he had to say. So I think you're sort of, you're talking about something that, that could have, would have, maybe have happened, but in fact didn't. And more importantly, once something's public, the value of, of any improvement is priced into the selling price. So do I think it's a good example? No, it's a terrible example. At the same time, though, it's a good example of why there need to be strict rules if they're going to have member-driven or administration-driven priorities go to specific entities. And I hope to work to get that on, on a bipartisan basis. I've been trying to. One of the reasons I quit taking those earmarks years ago or, and forwarding them is that I felt we needed to have a process that was fairer and transparent, and we don't have that yet. And so what Daryl Issa is saying essentially is, is that um, he asked for the earmarks for the road widening, yes, but he didn't own the property at a time. Later, when he bought the property, the earmarks were well known about it, so he wasn't profiting in an underhanded way. Okay. Eric, thank you so much for speaking to us. Seniors at a San Diego charter school are trying to lure President Barack Obama to their graduation ceremony. KPBS reporter Dwayne Brown takes a look at why it's the only California school competing in this national commencement competition. They're flying remote controlled fish and sharks. There's an old Chinese saying, give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach a man how to fish feed him for life. If they're remote control, they're very man maneuverable, they can fly inside a, a normal house, no problem. At High Tech High in Point Loma, learning by doing is key to better student performance. Ben Daly is the school's chief administrative officer. We want kids um, not just getting a, a paper and getting a C- minus and throwing it in the trash, but making something that has lasting value and presenting it to professionals in the field and getting feedback and seeing themselves entering the adult world. It's called project-based learning. Here's how it works. By focusing students on specific projects, teachers put them on a path to deepen their knowledge and build skills they'll need in the future. We think that kids should be engaged in the work they're doing, and they should produce meaningful work for a real audience. The emphasis here is on critical thinking, collaboration, and communication, things often missed in traditional classrooms. 99% of our graduates have gone off to college. 78% of our graduates have either graduated college or are still enrolled at this point. This charter school started with 200 students and 12 teachers in 2000. It will grow to 4,500 students, 200 teachers, and 11 schools this fall. One, two, one, two, three, go.
the school is already known around the world through videos like this one and these plastered all over the web. Now students at High Tech High International are using the same techniques to lure the President of the United States. There's a lot of talk in President Obama's campaign about the 21st century workforce. What are we repla are replacing the immersion wall with? Rashika Dariyanani and her senior classmates are competing with five other schools across the country. They want President Obama to speak at their graduation. If you look around, what that actually means is technological skills, leadership skills, ethics, and all of those are embodied in High Tech High International. We produce videos, we're out in the community, we're doing good work, and I think that that really sets us apart from the other schools. You can sense the air of excitement here at High Tech High International. 88 seniors. Half of them have been working on a special three-minute video project to land President Obama as their commencement speaker. About have until six. Hour, the ten hours, ten. hours is, I think, yeah. is so it ends at five. six o'clock is the bigger deadline, I think. High Tech High International is the only California school to qualify for the commencement competition. They had to shoot, produce, and edit a three-minute video in two days. The public gets to weigh in first, then the president will choose the winner the first week in May. And remember the flying fish and shark we saw at the beginning of the story? Seems learning by doing is about to pay off. This former student's obsession with tinkering will soon earn the toy company he now works for $40 a piece for flying indoor fish. One of the few flying remote control products that I find relaxing. KPBS's Dwayne Brown reporting. Public voting on the commencement videos ends on Tuesday, April 29th. The top three schools will then be notified. President Obama will choose the winner by May 6th. You can see and vote for your favorite online at whitehouse.gov slash commencement. Educators were filled with expectations for students at Lincoln High School when it was rebuilt as one of the most expensive campuses in the county four years ago. But according to KPBS Envision reporter Joanne Farian, reality has not quite matched their hopes. And Joanne joins me now to explain Lincoln High School was rebuilt back in 2007 with what goal in mind? Well, Mitha, the original school was small. It was 50 years old. Um, the community actually voted in favor of a bond measure to raise enough money to build a brand new school. So they tore the old school down. The students were sent to high schools all across the county. And then a number of years later, the brand new school opens up. This is 2007. And, and this school symbolized more than just bricks and mortar. This was sort of the beacon of hope for community. As most of our audience probably knows, Lincoln is in a poor neighborhood. So this school kind of represented the dream, the dream of kids getting educated and going to college. And has that dream been met? I know it might be too soon, but has it been met? Well, right now, this spring, we're going to see the first freshman class graduate and graduate. And there was actually a goal, a, a real hard goal originally to have 85% of that graduating class uh, be college ready. In other words, they would have the college curriculum. We know that's not going to happen. Last year, 16%, 1-6% of the graduating class actually had that curriculum. So, um, no, in terms of that goal, it hasn't been met. We talk a lot about this in the documentary that airs tonight on KPBS. We sort of explore that, that those expectations and where they realize. I want to play for you now a clip that sort of addresses that expectation. And while the school has made some improvement on state test scores, it ranks among the lowest of all high schools in California. Failing grades for a school that four years ago promised a community 85% of its graduates this year would be college bound. Lincoln is far from achieving that goal. Last year, just 16% of the graduating class had the required courses to apply for college. Compare that to another new high school less than 20 miles north in an upper middle class suburb. Last year, 78% of Westview's graduates were college ready. What a difference 20 miles can make. At Westview, 8% of the students live at or around the poverty line. At Lincoln, it's more than 80%. Almost half the adults near Westview have a college degree. About one in six have a master's degree or higher. More than half the adults that live in the area surrounding Lincoln 
didn't graduate from high school. One in eight didn't finish elementary school. And so what are some of the obstacles to these kids being eligible for college? I think we have to look at the obstacles uh, for these kids in terms of just getting to school. That's what we learned in the making of this documentary. We spoke with uh, some staff members who actually for the first time this year made a list of the 100 kids who were truant most often and failing. And they decided to go into the homes of all 100 kids and find out why aren't you getting to school, why are you failing? What they learned was we had, they, there were kids who were going out without food. There were kids who were home alone. There were kids who had just witnessed, uh, their, one child who had just witnessed his father's death. All of these uh, tragic reasons in terms of kids not even getting to school. There are uh, issues of poverty, kids who don't have bus passes, um, kids who don't have a stable environment. So over and over, what we learned was really, it was just getting them to the building was an obstacle. So you pose a very pertinent question in your documentary. You say, you ask, what who is failing these kids? Is it the school or is it the community? Did you find any answers? Well, I have to tell you, I want to quote uh, one of the people we interview in our doc documentary. His name is Dr. Joe Johnson. He's with the National Center for Urban School Transformation at San Diego State University. And he says, we all have to take responsibility. Uh, if we send a message to our legislators that it's okay to cut funding for public education, that it's okay for kids to go without food, that it's okay for kids not to have transportation, then we are complicit in the failure, that we have to assume some of this responsibility and we have to speak up. And very uh, quickly, tell us when does the documentary air? It airs tonight at 9 o'clock on KPBS television. Joanne, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Amitha. A tempest is brewing around best-selling author Greg Mortensen's Three Cups of Tea. After 60 Minutes did an expose alleging that key parts of the book were fabricated. I should say that Three Cups of Tea was selected in 2008 for KPBS's One Book, One San Diego reading program. Beth Ford Roth, KPBS reporter and author of the KPBS military blog Home Post, has been following the story and she joins me now with more. Beth, Three Cups of Tea received so much critical acclaim. Why was it selected as a primer for U.S. forces in Afghanistan? Well, a lot of the top military brass, like David Petraeus, um, really appreciated the message of the book, which was education is a way to fight uh, militant extremism in parts of the world like Afghanistan and Pakistan. And so they really took that message to heart. And what were some of the inspirational lessons that were contained in the book that really appealed to military leaders and people on the ground? Well, they liked the idea that you could sort of win over hearts and minds um, in these villages, these small villages, by sitting and having cups of tea with tribal leaders um, and just simply talking. And that was a way to get your message across as opposed to a, a more military point of view. Um, and actually, the military got in touch with Mortensen after he published this book and wanted him to become involved in how they sort of spoke with, with the Afghans and, and the Pakistanis. And when Mortensen was here in San Diego, he spoke about one really poignant email he received from top military brass. And then he said, ultimately, this is a war that will not be one with bombs, but with books that excite the imagination and the mind. And he said, it's education that will determine whether the next generation becomes literate patriots or illiterate terrorists. The stakes could not be higher. And what's interesting is um, the man he was talking about, Colonel Kalinda, is one of the few military uh, folks to come out after this whole uh, kerfuffle has happened and say, look, what Mortensen has done, despite whether the book is true or not, has really um, helped the military in creating relationships with Afghan elders and helping to build schools. And so he's come out not representing the Pentagon, but he's come out on his own to say, you know, the message is still there and we still believe in it. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more because the Pentagon has had a, a pretty strong relationship with Mortensen. What has been their reaction to these allegations that there were fabrications in the book? It's interesting. It's been radio silence. Um, we really haven't heard anything from the Pentagon. And um, as I said, uh, Colonel Kalinda has been really the only one to come out 
and speak on behalf of Mortensen, not sort of specifically pointing out anything in the book, um, but saying the message of being able to sit down and talk with someone from another country, another culture, is going to go a long way towards creating relationships and, and helping the military efforts in places like Afghanistan. What were the inaccuracies in the book? Well, um, one of the big inaccuracies, I guess, in the, in the follow-up book, really, was that Mortensen was kidnapped by the Taliban, and according to 60 Minutes, they spoke with um, one of the so-called Taliban in a photograph with Mortensen, and that man is a well-known scholar and has said, you know, I'm, I'm not part of the Taliban. And then in Three Cups of Tea, the critical um, scene in the book is when Mortensen comes down from K2, the second highest mountain in the world, and is apparently in terrible shape and goes to a village and um, this village nurses him with yak butter and, and tea and uh, a little girl asks him, will you build a school for us? And he promises her that he will and then he does and it turns out that that um, event never happened. So what has Mortensen's response been? Well, he's spoken with his hometown newspaper um, and hasn't really been specific, sort of kind of a James Fry kind of reaction where, well, the editor sort of made me push together a bunch of different events into one event and I wasn't comfortable with it, and um, but nothing real specific. And in the 60 Minutes piece, um, Steve Kropp tried to get in touch with uh, Mortensen and wasn't able to do it, cornered him at a book signing, and Mortensen took off and went out the back door. So um, it's he, he really hasn't come out to defend himself wholeheartedly. And I think people are just waiting to see what will happen. Okay. Well, Beth, thank you so much. Thank you. Culture Shock Dance Center has been teaching San Diegans to break dance for years. Their hip-hop dancers have won MTV competitions and performed in music videos. This weekend, Culture Shock dancers, young and old, will take to the stage. KPBS reporter Angela Carone and video journalist Katie Euphrat give us a sneak peek at rehearsal. <laughs> with my brother that he really loved to dance but I really was interested in hip hop and then I started like big dance. Hip hop dancing? I just like dancing a lot because I'm usually energetic. I came in and tried out and I almost died because I don't think I worked out before that. So I was, I was like 15 pounds heavier and I, I almost keeled over. The Culture Shock family ranges from ages four to 40 something. We're, we're, we're up there. There's no age limit. Culture Shock, what is Culture Shock? Culture Shock is uh, an organization that was created to provide street dancers a forum, a, a home base, a belongingness to create hip hop dance and to perform it. Started in San Diego 19 years ago, 1993, and, and it kind of blew up. So we're in Los Angeles and Oakland and Vegas and Chicago, Atlanta and DC um, and in Canada. So you'll see a lot of breaking. You'll see the girls tearing it up alongside the guys. I mean, our mighties are scary. They're so good. It kind of looks like a backstage. I do a lot of top rocks and a lot of footwork and a lot of freezes. This is a freeze. It's overwhelming the joy that you feel while you're watching these kids express themselves. <laughs> I just got even better when I figured out how to do a one handstand even better. It was a little bit cooler. I think if I were to break dance now, I'd really probably break a bone or I'd hurt myself. I mean, for myself personally, I like to just, you know, be in a company of people who love music and who love to dance. And that's, that's the, what's the most important to me.
KPBS's Angela Carone and Katie Euphrat reporting. You can see more of these dancers at Culture Shock's two performances on Saturday at the Garfield Theatre in La Jolla. And now here's Peggy Pico with an update on what KPBS is working on for next week. And tune into Morning Edition on Monday to find out how immigrant health care workers are getting certified to practice in Imperial Valley. And on these days, schools in the South Bay are trying to replace chips and cookies with salads and fresh food. Find out why there's resistance. Thanks, Peggy. You can comment on any of the stories you saw tonight by going to our website at kpbs.org slash sdweek. We'd love to hear from you. And now, here's a look at your weekend weather forecast. Thanks for watching. Good night.